And we're live in three, two, one. And welcome everybody to another episode of the Planet Mullins podcast. I'm really excited today to have uh, JJ San Savarino with me. He is an amazing guitar player, a writer, a um, touring musician. He plays with Maxi Priest, which is gotta be unbelievable. And we're gonna get into a whole thing about his career. He's live with us from New York tonight. Hey, JJ. What's up, Rob? How are you, man? I, I'm doing good, man. I, um, I'm doing so well that I, I wish I could afford to go buy a piano at Pierre's Fine Pianos because they have new Steinways there. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. I know. And it's uh, in West LA at 11039 West Pico. I have a little teaching studio there. It's where I base my teaching program out of. And uh, Pierre Irwin will be happy to help you look at a new Fazioli or a pre-owned Steinway. Uh, they've got digitals. They've got grants. They do rebuilding work. And, uh, and they've remarkably been kind of the place that survived all the COVID stuff and everything in West LA. So all you have to do, folks, go to www.pierresfinepianos.com and just uh, send Pierre an email and he will hook you up. All right. So, JJ, I got to tell you, man, this funny little story about how, uh, you know, how I met you. I'm just now kind of meeting, meeting you. But I was on Facebook one night about three months ago and it was in the heart of the really bad COVID thing in New York. And it was actually everywhere, it's worldwide. And you know, we had like Fauci on TV and everybody was predicting there's gonna be like 10 million dead in America by uh, June 1st. And um, you know, there was gonna be an international war. And there was a China and the Russians and then it was going crazy. So on a Friday night, I'm on Facebook and this little bing, this little light pops up and it says, um, JJ San Savarino uh, just went live and I'm like, I don't have no, no clue who this cat is at all, but you know, I'm not having a good afternoon and I would love to see something cool. So I just go click. And dude, <clears throat> you are you got like a studio and then you have these super dope beats. It's not like the lame-o, like the Kenny G kind of little fluffy stuff. It's like hard, man. Like with an island and you know, roots and the black vibe and everything. It's just the beat is crushing it. You're up there with your guitar and you're dancing to the front and you're dancing to the back. And then you're saying, hey, and I want to give a shout out. And I'm thinking, man, and it was really, I mean, especially, you know, it's hard broadcasting on the internet because it can be good or bad, but just the quality of what you were doing and your energy and your vibe is what turned me into your fan. So then I started watching all these Fridays and now it's been like three months since then and uh, when you agreed to come on the show this week i was like man this is so great because i want to ask him how we got into that doing the whole show what was the inspiration for that well you know you really just i love i was listening to everything you said rob and the way you described it it's like sort of what i tried to base my career upon always loving being an instrumentalist and not a vocalist uh -huh. i had as you know because i don't know if you're singing that but no. um you have two options. You can be a side musician or you can be a backing musician, side musician, or you can be a recording artist. That leaves one format for me and that's jazz. And I'm not really a bebop player. So that keeps me out of the straight ad circuit. So I just try to take what I know, like, you know, the, the, the groove of New York and beats and Island, like you said, and put it all together and just have fun with it. So you described it perfectly. And, you know, the way that it came about was, you know, unfortunately, we got hit with COVID first, as everybody knows. I mean, we're like the one of the biggest hubs other than LA, right? And, Miami. and you know, it spread quickly, especially with the, the reason it spread so quickly here was it's so dense. You got to think we're not spread out. We're in a, we're in buildings. When I'm in the building right now, and there's somebody next to me, below me, across from me. So the density and the elevators. It was very difficult, and they were telling wow. everybody not to wear masks, so it spread. So what happened was, all of my shows, I woke up, I'll never forget this, it was Monday morning, March the 16th, the day before St. Patty's Day, and uh, New York got shut down. All the gigs got canceled, and I was said, wow, what am I going to do for money? I, and and I, I literally tried to get a job, and 
I don't have a lot of skills other than music, restaurant, and construction. They're the only three things I've ever done in my life. Never had an office job. Mm -hmm. So construction was shut down. Restaurants were shut down. I used to play in the subways. Subways were, you couldn't go in. So I was terrified. And um, I, I um, that weekend, I'll never forget, I tuned into Instagram Live and I saw D Nice, the DJ, had like a hundred thousand people watching or something like that. Wow. And it was insane, Rob. And it was like we just started doing some shots in the apartment and cranking it up and dancing. And it just was a real party. It got us away from all the anxiety we've been going through for weeks building up to this moment. Right. So I just said, you know what? I'd never done Facebook Live. I said, I watched a couple other people to get a feel for how they did. I can remember watching Max V and how he did it. And nobody else was really doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, that Thursday night, I March 26, I put it on and I said, let's just party like D nice did it. We had Instagram going and I was playing beats and playing songs like ain't no stopping us now. My originals and doing shots on camera. My wife was dancing. So it was born from there. We had a few hundred people tuning in, which was very flattering for me because I'm not a major artist by any means. And they were commenting and it was born from there and we've done 26 shows. Wow, 26 and it's, it's a weekly show. So it's 26 we, weeks of it, right? So what I did was then the following week, the second week, I did something that wasn't really a smart move. I said, I'm only gonna broadcast on Instagram. So I was trying to get my Facebook people to get into Instagram so we could kind of integrate the two families of Instagram and Facebook. And a lot of my crowd is an older crowd. And so it, my Instagram, it went up a little bit, but by no means did I have the response from people that weren't willing to leave Facebook. Right. So then I took a week off and then I said, like, I'm going to move it to Friday, JJ Friday Night Live. And then we did 24 straight shows from there. We haven't stopped. So that's the whole history. That's when I, that's when I first got it was, I think, on your first Friday. And I know about the difference between Instagram and Facebook because Instagram is really hard to use if you're a Facebooker. Like when you first go on Instagram and you're trying to just post a simple link on there, it won't even let you do that. You know? Yeah, it's, it's a whole different feel. Yeah, it's a different thing. It's a younger crowd mostly. But... What I decided when I decided to make my own show, and you were part of the inspiration for that, along with a bunch of my other friends, is that I'm doing it on YouTube simply because YouTube seems to be the one that's most trustable. Like Facebook started censoring, and they, they're sending yeah. out all this stuff to guys like you now saying, oh, we're not going to let, let you do it. Is that true? Well, what, what, what would happen was, is the show built I, I developed a certain fan base. Everybody was in every week, 100 people like every week. And um, people would start to request stuff. And it was fun for me because, like, I'm not sure about you as a piano pianist, but uh, most of the stuff that I transcribed as a guitarist was guitar music, mm -hmm. some piano music, some horn music, chordal stuff. But I didn't really dig into transcribing tons and tons of vocal stuff. Uh, you know, I was always like, learn the chords, the parts, the guitar picking patterns, some of the melodies. So it became a new thing. It was born where I was getting so many requests, sometimes 12 requests a week of random stuff that I would have to learn the melodies for now. So uh, it, it was, it, it actually felt like it, it made me a better musician because it made me listen to singers a little more and phrasings. And then it made me leave more space and it really helped me a lot, Rob. But now I started doing so much cover music that it became maybe three quarter, two thirds to three quarters of cover and the rest of my own. And Facebook started popping up. And when I'm playing Michael Jackson, they mute me or. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Or I would be playing Love Theme by Barry White and they'd mute me. And sometimes they'd even shut me off. So wow. I, what was happening, I think, was um, as, you, as you and I know, but I'm not sure if the, the general public knows that when you play other people's music, they're entitled to ro royalties for you playing their music. And right. Facebook did, doesn't want to individually censor us to collect royalties for playing a Michael Jackson song 
or Prince song or something like that. So they just mute and censor so that when ASCAP and BMI comes looking for them, they said that they muted us. Oh. Uh, that's, that's where we're at now. So this past Friday, the 26th, I did an all original show, only my original stuff. And um, they muted me. And then I was like, how are they gonna mute me playing my own music? And then they took the mute off when they realized that I owned everything from it, so. Oh, uh, wow. Well, isn't, isn't that a trip? Because I've actually, um, a couple of the other shows I've done, people have gotten, uh, you know, these threatening things on YouTube for using their own music on YouTube. I know. I've done that too. And uh, honestly, my friend, if the, you know, they used to have a concept where the big companies making the big dollars in the world would always contribute money to the arts. This went on for the last 50 years of my life and it stopped about 10 years ago, really stopped like with the 2008 crash. That was 12 years ago. But look, man, if Facebook and all their billions of freaking dollars, they can make all these artificial intelligence things, make an artificial intelligence thing that the money is gonna go. My, okay, you play a Michael Jackson song. Okay, that money is gonna go, but it isn't gonna come out of your pocket. No, it has no. to come out of a donor's pocket. It should come out of Facebook's pocket for a funding for the arts. Yeah. Facebook, if they've got a hundred billion dollars, let's put a billion dollars into not censoring guys like you just trying to like have a good time and pump everybody up, but they should have an app for that where they pay for it. Well, we've we suffered enough, bro. I mean, I get animated about this. I know, me too, Robin. You're right. It's like it. it the world is a, in 2020, September 27th today. The world has changed so much, mm -hmm. and just what you said, it really seems that so many people, regular people like you and I, and I'm sure my fan base and your fan base, really appreciate the arts, dance, uh, theater, music, painting, etc. But I just feel like those big mega companies that have gotten so much bigger that they don't, I don't, they don't see the value. I don't feel like they appreciate it as much. There's not as many people that are reaching out to us to support us. And I mean, look, New York City is a perfect example. When I was a kid, New York City was very slummy and you had arts everywhere because artists could afford to live in Soho. Wow. And when you put a collective of creative people together, nothing but creativity is gonna blossom from that. Now, when you out get everybody that can't afford to live and nobody's there anymore, you're not gonna get a ton of creativity sprouting up like it used to be. So we have definitely a drought going on. I think of people that appreciate the arts and are willing to help. And I don't know, we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed, keep, keep looking for yeah. help. Well, it's the, it's the entire concept of patron of the arts. And, you know, the modern day one, the online one is called Patreon. I don't know if you have a Patreon. I've heard about Patreon, yeah. yeah so, but look, man, here's what happens is I, and I had a couple of friends that are like, oh man, I'm doing really great on Patreon. You should do it. So I go over to Patreon and I start looking into it. And it's like marrying two women that never sleep. <laughs> That's what Patreon is. If you're a guy like me, it's like, oh, I've got Betsy and Cindy, and neither one of them is ever going to sleep, and they're always going to need something. You want to talk to me in this one, and there's that one, and there's that one, and that one. And that. Dude, I just, I, I looked at Patreon, and I said, hats off to the people that can do it, because a lot of younger people do it because they have the energy. I see but, it all the time, especially on YouTube, because there's a couple of guys that I'm always watching, and they're like, if you like what you're seeing, you can support us with Patreon and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I, but I, I ain't going there, man. And I think, I think the way that you're doing it, cause see what carries, well, it carries communities. And I mean, it carries the world, like the look on your face, the spirit of you. That was the thing. And I, I, I turned to my girl when I was like, look at this guy. This guy is just like, I mean, he's like serious, but he's clowning, you know? Because and he's mugging clowning, a little bit, right? and he's like playing his butt off. Now, um, how did you get to like playing guitar that well? You're obviously a virtuoso, you can play any style. You're, they say the critics call you uh, 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 Ben Tanner or something. <laughs> well, it's funny. My, my two favorite guitarists are Carlos Santana and George Benson. Oh, and okay. 
I mean, I, I love, love jazz music. I love it. Um, and I, I literally am every day, maybe not every day. I didn't study today. It was Sunday. I took the day off. Right. I, I, I'm, I, YouTube has so many, you know, these videos. There's so much material available nowadays. Right. When, you, when you and I were coming up, man, the only way we could learn other than getting a lesson from somebody was to put a record on. Right. And, and I, I used to, when there was a passage that was really fast and I couldn't hear it, I used to kind of hold my finger down on the record a little and slow it down. <laughs> and we used to have to work so hard to get information. Right. You could buy a book. Um, you'd, have, you'd have to listen and transcribe or get a lesson. Nowadays on YouTube, man, if you, they give it right to you and they'll do it slow. It's charted out. It's, it's insane. So I'm always trying to study this with these great tools and, I love jazz so much, and it's just a never-ending quest, as you know, because you're a fabulous player yourself. Right. And so, just kind. Of, but I love rock, and I love R and B, and and reggae. And what the most important thing that helped me make a career in this business was one thing: I got to have a good attitude, because nobody wants to work with a. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> With a what was that? <laughs> if you could, if you do editing, you could put like the dollar cross spam bops. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the the key for me was learning infinite, learning millions of songs. Okay. And and um, you know, whether they were reggae. Okay, so it really started for me as a kid. I come from a, a family of singers. My grandmother was an opera singer. She went to Juilliard. Uh, my grandfather was a doo-wop singer in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. My uncles were all doo-wop singers, had a doo-wop group in the Bronx and performed up until the day that they broke, they, most of them passed away. But I remember as a kid on Sunday dinner, on a, in a, we're Italian, yeah, you got Sunday dinner, you have the meatballs and the macaronis at grandma's and uh, everybody's eating and after everybody starts singing doo-wop. And I'm kind of sitting there because I was... 16 years old, 14 years old, 13 years old. I wasn't really listening to the doo-wop. I was listening to like Carlos Santana. Right. And, you know, more, I wasn't John, listening to that John old stuff. John McLaughlin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Al Demiola, you know. And um, so these guys would always say, come on, because my real name is Joseph. They'd say, Joey, come on. You sing the, the, the baritone part, sing this part. And I would say, ah, I don't know the song. What's the matter with this kid? <laughs> and my father's nickname was Junior. They say, Junior, what's wrong with this kid? How does he not know these songs? So now as a kid, you feel kind of bad. You feel an outcast. So I eventually would learn all these doo-wop songs. Wow. Now the next thing is I'm playing in the village in, is, is, is in Manhattan, and I'm, I'm playing all these R&B gigs in the, in the late 80s. And, um, you know, most of the time, I'm the only white guy on stage, and they're calling Teddy Pendergrass, and they're calling um, uh, Prince, or they're just calling, uh, you know, uh, Alicia Myers, uh, just, just all kinds of stuff. Right. And if you don't know it, they're like, you stand out because a lot of those songs would have a signature guitar line. And oh, before right. I let go, Frankie Beverly and Mays. And that song starts, if you don't play the guitar solo, you obviously don't know it and you get a boo. You know? <laughs> right, right. Well, so, so, so you would have to learn all these R&B songs. Uh, okay. You, you go to a jazz sit-in, they call something that you don't know and you're on stage, you really feel like a jerk trying to fake through a whole set of changes of tune you don't know, you don't sound like garbage, you know? Right. And it became reggae music. And I'd be the only guy in a reggae say, you don't know this song? Oh, who this white boy? Yeah, I just this white boy. Get rid of me. I can't play nothing. I got to learn all. So this, Rob, led to me learning songs all the time. And that's helped me because if, if you go to the top 10 billboard right now, I probably could play any of them that are not rap songs. But I could play the chords that are rap songs, but I could play the melodies to all the top 40 songs because I'm always learning new music, you know? Yeah, well, it seems like, that's a, I had similar experiences when I was like 16 and 17 because I was in Denver and I was sneaking up the fire escape to this club in the winter, going in the back door, trying to hear like, you know, Ernie Watts play and oh, stuff nice. like that. And they had a whole scene. There was a guy, Billy Tolls, and 
a piano player with the coolest name. His name was Bud Poindexter. You know, I was like, that's the jazziest name I ever heard, you know. That was a good one, yeah. And I would get up there and they'd say, okay, kid. And they had another place in downtown and really run down at uh, 20th and Market or 20th and Larimer called, uh, ah, shit, I can't remember the name of it, El Chapultepec. And, you know, when you're this young, right, you're go you want to hear the music because that's the vibe. You got all these live cats and awesome. there's some bad dudes. The older guys are the badass dudes. So I get in there. They say, okay, let's play softly as the morning sunrise. One, two, one, two, three. And I'm like, oh, oh shit. And it's worse for you as a piano player because they want to hear the chord right away. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to have that minor one, six, two, five oh. uh, dominant thing happen right away. Yep. And then, you know, and I would see these saxophone players looking over at me with that same kind of thing, just kind of doing the face bomb, like, who let the white kid out of his basement? <laughs> you know, why? why right but you know what we have to do those because it was important to get your butt kicked it's right. important to feel like you know sometimes you know we all were, we're artists musicians sometimes we get up on our high horse we were kicking butt and it's good to get knocked off sometimes and it makes <laughs> you want to get back in the shed and practice you know right exactly so i gotta i gotta ask you about this whole max and priest thing man because oh. when i was reading your bio and it said you had been on these massive world tours with him for decades. Oof. That's got to be unbelievable. I mean, that whole experience. How did you get that gig? Let's start there. Well, well, first of all, he is unbelievable. His voice today still sounds as good as it ever did. Mm -hmm. And we, and you know, because you've worked with singers who maybe change keys lower over the years. Right. We do all the songs in the original keys from the 80s and the 90s. Wow. He doesn't, yeah, he's still singing his butt off. And uh, so I was, you know, touring pretty heavy around 94 uh, with a lot of reggae groups. I okay. was working with like Sean Paul at the time before Sean Paul was discovered. I was working with some of the, the Marlies. I was working with a group called The Meditations. I was touring with them. Junior Reed, Anthony B., Freddie McGregor, Gregory Isaacs. Uh, all these legends and um, Maxi was like my favorite and uh, I was just doing a, a tour with a guy named Supercat who was a, a real famous reggae singer and the musical director for Supercat got the MD gig for Maxi and he put a new band together and he, uh, he called me and uh, that was in 2000 and we immediately went on a tour to Japan and then a, a US tour and then back to Japan and then Australia, New Zealand, Africa, and here we are 20 years later. Wow, man. Well, with all of that travel, you know, people say, um, you know, is it a strain on your life or a stress or whatever? And for me, it was always, no, it's great. I love the road. And, you know, anytime I can be somewhere where if I make the room dirty or I make a mess, someone else is going to clean it. And then the next day, there's going to be like little fruit basket there and yeah, fresh pillows. It. And, um, you know, and you get to meet so many people. Like, did you have so far, do you have a favorite country or a favorite gig that you ever did? I mean, there's been so many. Well, I'll tell you one thing, just to touch what you said. One thing about being on the road, you said you love it. I love it. Being a road musician, everybody's not cut out for it. And I'll tell you, like, some of these tours we did in the early 90s before I was with Maxi were brutal. We'd be in a van, uh, and in, we would do in 28 days, we'd do 25 shows. Wow. And, and the three days that we didn't perform were because they were, like, 24-hour drives. Wow. Uh -huh. We would literally get off the, sh up, out of, off the stage into the van and drive for 24 straight hours and get to where we were going to shower. And then, you know, so you, it's not cut out for everybody. When we do some of these tours in the early days of Maxi, we'd be on 40 planes in 30 days. Wow. Yeah, because you have layovers sometimes. And those days were crazy, man. They were like, the day would start out, you, you check into the hotel, you run from the hotel to sound check, long sound check, they're always long for some reason. <laughs> rush back, take a shower, rush back, do the show. Then they want to take you out to the club, dinner, nightclub. We're on a nightclub all night. We got to rush you back to the hotel because we got a 6 a.m. flight. Right. <laughs> on the way to the hotel, 
flight, layover, check into the land, get to the hotel, go to sound check, long sound check. <laughs> and this cycle would repeat every day. When you get like one day off, no one would even hear you be in your hotel knocked out. Right, right. That, I, I, I think, you know, I talked to one of the younger bass player guys who's now about 30. We were doing a little straight ahead gig um, in LA like five years ago and he was 25 then. And I said, hey man, one of my friends got the gig playing drums for Taylor Swift. And I was like, that's gotta be a big ass gig. And the guy was getting a thousand bucks a week with a brutal schedule and like no per diem. Wow, that's terrible. Terrible. I mean, we were getting better money than that in the 80s. That's just and not fair that they, they, they it, this happens a lot. A lot of these R&B artists, what they would do was, uh, I remember in the 90s when you had, and I'm not going to say that these people were necessarily doing it, but you had a lot of these R&B artists, that were, a lot of them were rehearsing at the same place, like Mary J. Blige, Faith Evans, um, a lot of these bad boy groups, and they, a lot of the New York guys had the gigs. And what would happen was, as they would grow, the, these musicians, as we get older, we want a little better, bigger piece of the pie. Right. You know, we don't want to play for X hundred per week. We're getting older, we're grown men, you know, we got families. Right. And then as we would ask for more money, a lot of times they would dump these bands and go, go to the church and get these kids playing gospel. They were like 19 years old and pay them like 500 bucks a week. Right. Now, I'm not saying any of those groups that I just mentioned did that. I was just using them at that time period. There was a lot of that going on where they, they were using a lot of, and then it's perfect. Taylor Swift paying a drummer $1,000, you could be giving him 10000 and that would be fair. You know? I mean, back in the big days of uh, Michael Jackson, I think it was Phil and Gaines was getting something like 40000 a month or, or something like that, I, I heard. Both and that actually is you know, somewhat commensurate, but the, the problem with, the problem with it is that you put in all your time and sometimes the business people bes behind the main artist, they're always looking for a way to cut the overhead and they don't have any loyalty to the band. Even if the artist, let's say you're working for like frickin' Whitney Houston when she was here, the, you know, she may love the band, but the people, behind her business things like, ah, oh, well, you know, these guys are starting to get a little too old for the video. And then, right. you know, we can pick up this, like you said, the cheap, uh, the cheap thing and the gospel kids at the church will be thrilled. I mean, in jazz, Maynard Ferguson of all people was the king of doing that. Like he would have these bands that would go out and he would offer them like $50 a night or something. And they were like, cool. And the next tour he would, he would be paying 40 wow and you know you just think about that kind of a mentality and it's exactly opposite of the kind of mentality that you have and that i have because we both are happy people i remember getting written up and maybe you could tell me about your best and worst reviews but i got wrote up at la times for being uh too happy to be a, taken seriously as a musician because i was having too much fun <laughs> You know, <laughs> boy, sometimes you just can't do anything right. You know, what I mean? right? I mean, uh, do you? Uh, obviously, you've had reviews and different bands and this and that. Like, have you ever had a review that stood out so great you put it up on your wall, and then a bad one that you like don't talk about or anything? Well, you know, there's you know what always gets me. <laughs> My feelings get hurt when, like, for instance, all right, a couple quick things. One time on my Facebook live show, I, a month or two ago, I don't remember when, I like, you know, I, I tried to turn it into a little bit of a show and I would have a thing where I would do some birthday shout outs and right. I would talk about some little light social issues like get out there and vote, do your census, um, that kind of stuff. So there was one guy who put a comment on the screen and said, stop talking and play music. <laughs> broke my heart I was like, i'm just saying you know happy birthday we love you and they're like shut up and play and then it's like when you put a video up on youtube and you get you say oh wow awesome i got a hundred thumbs up and three thumbs down why do they give me a thumbs down <laughs> it breaks my heart because we just trying you know we're like we're, we're, like you said we're both happy people and 
We're really just trying to make people feel good. And that's how I've always tried to model my career is to be humble, speak to people after shows and sign autographs and, and smile and, and that, that, that kind of stuff. And there's always somebody out there who wants to knock you down, you know? Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting because it used to be, it all came out in print and we'd be waiting the next day or my manager would be like, okay, man, I, uh, I, I schmoozed with the writer from the LA times. I bought him wine all night. I hope that's a good review. We got to wait for the Sunday paper to come out. And then we'd be like, oh no, you know, <laughs> and, but now with what you're doing, it's so instantaneous because <laughs> you know, you're managing when you're doing your show, I see you up there and you're not only are you playing, but you're running a studio full of tracks and then you've got instant messages, Facebook messages coming up. And then you've got uh, like probably texts and other things. It's like this flood of all this multitasking. So early on when I was watching you, I was like, man, he's like holding that lick right now. And then you're up at the computer with the other hand going, what the <laughs> hell did that guy just say? I'm here on G minor seven. I only got eight more bars. How am I going to text him back? <laughs> you know, the first show that I did back in March, I was like, it was the first time I said I'd ever gone live. And it was like what my wife says, the boo kitty syndrome. I'm like playing, I'm looking at comments, I'm shouting out. And I played lousy because I had no focus. I had no center. It was just, <laughs> I was all over the place. So what I started doing was to, trying to develop it into a show. And, uh, you know, I, I start the, that morning and try to put a playlist in order. And then I started taking the camera and I, instead of me seeing what was happening in selfie mode, I would film it this way. And then I had my daughter and my wife in the other room writing down the names. Oh, smart. Yeah, and giving me a paper because it was, and then I would do like, I call them bumpers. I put one song that I don't play over and I say, hey, what's up everybody? And that's my intro monologue, et cetera. <laughs> then I play a couple of songs. And then after two songs, people are checking in. So. You got to shout people out quick because they don't stay long sometimes. Right, right, right. <laughs> They're just in and out sometimes, which is cool, you know. So I would take a, a break after the two songs and have another bumper would play. It would be something, maybe a song that I really dug, like a Quincy Jones song or something. And then I would do my shout outs and then go into the next part of my songs and then another bumper and do more shout outs or do happy birthdays. So I, I became the turn it into a format where I could actually focus on playing a little bit more. Right. And then and, you're kind of doing the, the talking part as a separate thing. And then yes. it's like you're hosting your own hour or two hour. I mean, so, dude, sometimes you go like three hours, right? Yeah. And that was another thing, man. It's like, you know, it's not like we're on the bandstand where I can say, Rob Mullins on the keys and take a solo. I can go get a drink of water <laughs> and, right. you can blow, and you can blow their minds for like two or three minutes. Right. Then, um, <laughs> solo next guy. Right. It's like, I got to fill in every second. So I used to, I had to start practicing really hard again. Uh -huh. because I was obviously running out of things to say on my guitar and my, I would run out of steam a little bit. So, I really had to start practicing and learning songs. So it became like every week, I didn't have a job. There's no gigs, nothing going on at the bar. Not all I had to do was JJ Live. Right. So I start on Monday and think about the songs and start shedding and getting ready. And it, it really was helped me mentally, spiritually, physically. It was the greatest thing that happened to me during this, this pandemic, you know? Well, man, well, I, you know, I got to say, I'm going to say two things right in one little paragraph here. I think like, cause the only person that did that kind of marathon stuff is Prince, you know, Prince, like, and when I see other people on Facebook, they poop out after an hour. I don't see any three hour, like just balls to the walls, killing it. Like what you do. That's one side of it. But like you said, you're around all these people. Do the neighbors flip out? What's happening with the neighbors? <laughs> Funny thing to say that. <laughs> you, um, let's just say, the nicer the neighborhood you live in, the more people complain about things. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta live, I mean, I don't live in the hood. I mean, but I live in the streets a little bit. You know, there's like music in that, and the, on the people with the car stereos, people jamming the music upstairs over here. And like, 
So people are just partying around the clock in New York. And depending, when you're in a nice, expensive doorman building, uh, people enforce things. But when you live in like a building and, and people are like partying, you know, they, they, they leave you alone. And I always say, man, I've been playing for three hours. It's 1130 at night, man. And, and I'm cranking it in this little room here. Oh, I know. And sometimes I'm jumping up and down and then I'll get somebody, that my, one of my kids will give me an evil look, say, you got to piss them off that <laughs> But uh, but the funny thing is when I see them in the in the hallway or something, it was like, "Hey, how you doing?" Like, "Hey, man, good to see you." I'm like, Phew. "Thank you, thank you." Right, exactly. Yeah, because I um in my place in L.A., I have a grand piano, and I went through and actually bought foam for all the windows that face, you know, that face towards the other building, and on the other side is a street, but it's over a carport. The Last four places I've lived in were all over carports. Wow. So it's like a box, a suspended box in the air with no neighbors. That's great, man. And That's it's so blessing. hard to find that though. I mean, I this last, uh, my, my most recent place in LA, I drove around two and a half years looking for that situation while I was living somewhere else, you know? And just always thinking, because if you're in a big city, Dude, crazy stuff can go left in your neighborhood. I mean, with the um, with the pandemic and the homeless thing and the rioting and looting, like May in Los Angeles was the scariest thing I ever lived yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, like we really, a lot of our cities in America hit rock bottom. You know, it's been just a tough time. And, and you know, I don't ever condone violence and looting and that. That's just, it's not right. But in a weird way, I can understand some young kids that are so frustrated at a dead end doesn't make it right but a lot of times these young kids don't get the opportunity to get any common sense because they're just around so many knuckleheads in their in their in their community and there's bad stuff going on in the community and nobody cares and a lot of these young kids they don't get the opportunity to get any common sense in their head wow. to teach them and show them the right way mm -hmm. and they just this is LA New York Chicago anywhere and it's like it just it, it sucks, but you know, hey, we can't save the world all one day, can we? And you, Rob, right? No, we can only do it Fridays from eight to eleven. What's that? <laughs> What's the, let me get a commercial in here. here. <laughs> eight thirty till the break of dawn. Eight thirty till the break of dawn. You know, it's it's interesting when I listen to the beats. I want to go back a little bit about the beats that are playing because. You know, I never, I never had the idea that rhythms were a lifestyle. Like I just, you know, when rap first was coming out, like '89 and '90 and stuff, and all this new music was hitting, and it, the beats were so intriguing to me because I was started out on the drums, and I was like, "Wow, man, this is so great!" And I could pick out the beats, and I could program stuff that good, and I could program stuff that was really unique. And there started being like a little buzz about some of the tracks that I could do. My studio was doing okay and everything. But what I didn't get is that there was a lifestyle thing associated with that. Like that music came out of what you're talking about. A lot of that frustration of the young people not yeah. having a direction. It's like, well, what are you going to do? You're either going to join the NBA or you're going to, or you're going to deal drugs. It's that, just, it's for a time, that was just how that, those were the options, man. It's just so little opportunity when you're in such um, unfortunate circumstances where a lot of people turn their backs on you. And and really, quite frankly, a lot of people just don't care. You know, there's a lot of people out there in the media when they when they see like, you know, a black, a black man or woman murdered, there's blatant racists out there to say good that's an that's a that's another black man or woman that's off this earth that's how people think and it's like it's and so many people feel like their back is turned and they have no opportunity and that's why when you can get music into people's hands like it's really really amazing and a lot of times people can't afford instruments so maybe djing and making beats is what was available to them you know Right, and you can get the instruments if you've got the politicians and the school boards using common sense because there ought to be a fund like there was way back in the day when I was a kid. They would raise money 
to get band instruments, man. It was a big deal. You'd go door to door. And because they understood that music has a way. And I was talking about, um, who was I talking to the other day? Because we, oh, uh, Kiki uh, Valera, who like escaped the whole Cuban communist thing. Mm. And we, we were talking about the repression that happens from the government. And then, then like you say, it's like, there's no common sense. There's no patron of the arts. And he was telling me, bro, when he was growing up in Cuba, they got one Beatles album smuggled in and they had to put the Beatles album in a Tchaikovsky sleeve. Oh, wow, that's, that's that's insane. Because if he was seen carrying the Beatles down the street, he would be arrested, bro. That's terrible, man. Wow. And, uh, and the, the thing is, though, is that music has wings. Music is like a liquid and a solid and a gas and an air and an explosion so and an earthquake. Cool. It's, it's, it travels, man. It gets into the community and it changes everything. You know, Rob, if you could imagine, like, let's say you're a kid and you're like in the inner city or somewhere where maybe even not even in the inner city, but you just don't have any money and your family can't afford for you to have an instrument. Could you imagine in a perfect world where you could, your school would have a music program, even a basic, simple music, but it would give you the instrument to use. Maybe not the half without renting it or making you buy it. Right. And now you put this trumpet and this young kid who's in sixth grade, seventh grade, whatever, right. and, and he starts saying, "Wow, this is fun." And then as he starts excelling, he's getting praise. He feels like he's doing something good. Now with YouTube, he goes on and sees Wynton Marsalis playing. It's like, "Oh my God, this guy is the most." He's so intrigued with Wynton. Now he gets to hear Wynton speak and talk about education and common sense. This is how like something as simple as giving a, a, a somebody an instrument, how it could give them sense and education. And direction for their life because, yes. you know, um, one of the things, uh, a different guest that I had last week, I'm learning so much good stuff from having this show and like having I all these great, I'm amazing. just learning so much. And one of my guests said, you know, if I hadn't had music to turn to, I would have become like a, a murderer, like an ax murderer or something, because I'm so pent up, like the, the rage that builds up inside people. And you see that in our current society, bro. There's like, everybody is this close to just having a nuclear meltdown on both That's sides. Rage. Right. And music is the thing that keeps me sane because see, I could always sit down at the piano and noodle around and just go, how cool, man. It just makes me feel better. Yep. And, you know, I, I know it makes you feel better, too, although you probably feel pretty good all the time. <laughs> I've, I, you know, I, I've <laughs> been through so much, I, and I'm, I'm grateful, A, to be alive. Right. I'm grateful that I have so much. I have a beautiful family, and, you know, I, I've got guitars. I got a little – this is a tiny room. It's only, I don't know, about eight by eight, but I get to write my music and play here every day, and I, I, I'm, I got food on the table, and I got to close – I'm very grateful. That's all I ever wanted in life is to be able to do music. Well, now that now that you're signed to like, you know, Intervision is no dumpy little label. Like they got some major people going on there. And now that you've been with that label like eight years already, what's that yeah. been like? And what do you got coming up in the future? Well, you know, it's a great label because when I was having a, a, a difficult time, I almost gave up music at one point. Mm -hmm. um, it just, I felt like, and I, I know you've been at this place before where you're working for other people, learning their songs or doing gigs and you maybe don't dig the music or they're just a hack. Then it's not really on the level, not the saying that we're the, the end all, but they're maybe not on our level. Let's say they're more amateur, we're professionals, okay? Okay, you right. You find yourself working for more amateurs and I just started not to enjoy music. It was like, Every call that came in, I had to take it because I needed the $100 gig and the $50 rehearsal. And God, it just would make my ears bleed learning the music. I got so frustrated, waiting for the phone to ring. No, If an artist doesn't want a tour, we're not staying on retainer. So right. I said, I'm going to give up music. I'm going to wow. save my money and I'm going to buy a bar. What? That's what I was going to do. Well, this was about 10 years ago. And... I um, started 
Yeah, I've always been in the restaurant business, like I said. So okay. I was bartending in, in Midtown Manhattan, not far from Times Square. And I started doing seven, eight, seven days a week, four doubles a week. So I was doing about 85 hours behind the bar every week. Wow. And, you know, a lot of drinking, no sleep. I did it for a year straight. I took Christmas, Christmas Eve, and Easter off, three days that year. The rest of it's solid. You don't get sick. You got to work. And I got put on to Intervision Records from a friend of mine, Steve Butler, who's now my booking agent. Okay. And it was just what I needed because I had a record that was done. And it was basically, they just wanted to distribute it for me. Mm -hmm. So it helped get me a, I did a radio campaign on my first single. It gave me distribution. It brought, and then I started getting bigger gigs and all of a sudden now I'm starting to, you know, tour a lot and doing a ton of festivals and, you know, and here we are. So I excelled in that time. So Intervision was very good to me in getting me started. And I have three re albums I've done with them already and a fourth wow. one coming out next year. Great. So I'm excited. It just feels good, man. Uh, it's a, that's such a great story because I had this gig at a steakhouse that I don't do anymore in LA. And it was a gig that it, it was, it had good things about it. It had a Steinway piano and uh, I know, and they kept it tuned as a very uh, wealthy, exclusive um, crowd. They never had to advertise because it was just, you know, Harrison Ford's coming in. And, nice. Um, you know, we had uh, Adam Sandler in like flip flops with his family. And then you got Harvey Mason Sr. who I worked with, hey Rob, I want to sit in and play, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, but what awesome. happened with it was that it was, it was an amateur that blew the whole thing and just nearly made me commit suicide for the same thing you're talking about, because dig this weird story. So it was a quartet with great players, except the leader, right, the saxophone player. So the club after these years, and all these people are coming in, but I'm not the boss, they're like, you got Rob Mullins, oh my God, the band is great but they hated the saxophone player. So, so they just called him one day and they said, well, we're sorry, Mr. Sax leader, but we're gonna have to let you go. People have complained. There's not gonna be any more sax and, uh, and you're fired. And dude, you know what this clock neck said? He said, <laughs> that's okay, I play drums. Oh, what? Now he doesn't play drums at all, he just wanted to keep the gig. That is insane. So then for about the next six months, for me, it was this like, I mean, he couldn't play two bars of time. And oh, he had, I, no, I mean, he couldn't even hold the sticks right or anything. And eventually I had to just like make up a story because I was starting to put like a down a fifth of vodka every <laughs> night after that gig. The bass players would call me up and say stuff like, Dude, it was so bad. I'm sleeping with my metronome on. <laughs> I mean, oh my, that's hilarious. That's, was, I've never heard that one. That's good. I had never heard it either, but it was just you know your ears, your your ears do start to bleed because when you know putting all these spiritual aspects and the tuning and the time that we put in, and we know what it's like when we're in tune and we're doing our gig correctly, we're reaching a lot of people. And we're kicking ass and everybody's having fun. And then you have all of these gradients of complete BS that, you know, degrade down from that. Oh, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I just said, look, I, I'll take some more students or I'll freaking, you know, work in a bar as a bartender. I was a bar back when I was young um, or just, you know, dump trash. I, I, but I'm not going on stage with somebody that can't play four beats of time. I can't do it. No, you shouldn't have to, especially at this stage in our careers, right? Right. Well, you know, the, the weird thing about that is the royalty thing is so different than how it was, you know, when it first started out. And my last week I had a Puerto Rican copyright intellectual property attorney who started a, a big band of like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Sammy Davis impersonators with an 18 piece band in Puerto Rico. And he's a lawyer and he was talking about the Puerto Rican scene. He's like, dude, we got guys that are getting like 4 billion streams, wow. you know, out of the Puerto Rican scene. Jeez. And I was like, wow, man, that's incredible. And then he was explaining how 
all the uh, you should watch it man because he does a whole class about how you know when you and i were younger how they would have the packaging deduction and then they would always you know fudge the royalties and everything and now he does the whole math formula about how all that works he he was really aghast but he was also a super positive guy like you he's just full of life and happening saying look man you know we had 21 sold out gigs and the band is great like his little big band thing they're getting and they're just doing old frank sinatra covers they're getting like eight nine twelve million views on youtube for one video unbelievable wow right and you know so so there's a lot of ways for this music to keep on going through and when the you know to kind of circle back around to the beginning it was just such a breath of fresh air when you pop up on there, because everything that had come up before you was like, I hate the president. All these people need to die. And then on the other end, it's like, nobody's going to take my gun because I got rights. You know, and it's just clashing, clashing, clash all day. And you know what? I don't talk politics on my show or race or religion, but I can talk stupid. <laughs> I can talk stupid because my, my buddy Stan, who's in who's in uh, War, the harmonica player for War. Cause you know- Oh, he's great. I know, I've seen him play. Yeah, he's, that's my best, awesome. he's my best friend, man. The guy's great. Well, he's we've been doing awesome. stuff 35 years. We go way back. So, and he's from New York. He's from the Bronx. Yeah, he's from the Bronx, right. I talked to him on the Soul Train crew, or the Tom Joyner cruise. I was playing with Maxi and we were watching War and I wonder, he had a Yankees hat on. Yeah, yeah. So, the next day I said, you wearing that Yankee set because you're from New York or you just like the style? Because yeah. I'm from the Bronx, pal. That's all right, man. What's up? What's this? <laughs> so, you know, Stan and I are down in Venice Beach where there's all kinds of melting pot stuff going on, all kinds of crazy, you got all the politics, all the rich people and the street people and all that. And, you know, some of my friends are very opinionated one way or the other. And Stan finally the other day just looked at his group of people there and he just says, well, here's how it is. So you got your left wing over here. You got your right wing over here. And both of wings are connected to the same bird. Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of, I mean, because you can spin out. If you want to spend your time spinning out and being unhappy, people, I know people actually do choose that. And I had seen that. And so I'm making this long story way too freaking long but i just said seen that all day long and then blam here's jj and yeah, you're crushing I, it it wear you out doesn't it when you see all of this stuff and you know i just watched this movie um i forget i can't remember what it's called the social uh dilemma or something like that yeah. and it's talking about how like facebook and these companies are really fueling this right yeah, it's, you should check it out if you got some time. It's a movie. It's about an hour and a half. Uh, it is real scary. But, you know, yeah. that's why, you know, I, I tell you something. We're lucky that we're able to shut it down and get our instrument out and play. Like, man, I've been, you know, I've been checking out all this Barry Harris stuff lately. Wow, cool. Yeah, and it really kind of put me, like, humbled me with certain things. <laughs> And I love that. So, like, I got my old, I, I stopped playing to, to, to a beat. I just put the metronome two and four. So if I'm doing something else, so maybe I'll try a one and three, but it's a different exercise. And I'm working all this great stuff, and it humbled me. And it just, I find so much joy. And the next thing you know, a few hours go by. And well, yeah, and then you're, you're learning something, and you're getting better at it. Connected from all the, the BS, you know? Yeah, I can't, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that's crazy for me is that my day gig is internet marketing. Oh, that must so be. That's awesome. one of my day gigs. Yeah. And that can get pretty tricky. But, sure. but the thing about it, man, is that I have a car. And, you know, for me, a lot of independence is about a car. Because if I can just get into my car and I can drive away from all the people, and, you know, I'm basically based in Los Angeles and sometimes in Denver. I, I make the drive, bro. I never fly it anymore. I don't go to LAX and go through all that BS. You don't mind getting in your car? I, I, driving doesn't bother me either because 
I'm like a tour musician. I spend my life on the road. Right. I mean, it's, it's like when you get in the car, sometimes I won't even listen to music. Just right. silence. Yes. Sometimes. Then yeah. some music or from country to jazz or whatever. And then maybe some AM radio talk. And then right. nothing. I can. I, I know what you mean, Rob. It's, it's uh, yeah, and I, I love the nature. Like there's this whole stretch through Utah where it's all kind of Grand Canyon-ish. And there's, especially during this COVID thing, um, cause I, you know, I make the trip probably about once every six weeks. I was literally in this Valley where there was not a single soul for about a hundred miles anywhere. Amazing. And I just parked and stood there and did this. And I was just so happy because when you don't have all of that noise, like, you know, light is noise. When you're in yeah. cities with too much light, it's actual noise. It's interference with what's coming in from outer space and cars are noise and trucks are noise and um, televisions and apartment buildings. And when you don't have any of the noise, man, wow, you don't even need to smoke one. I you know. just stand yeah, there and feel the whole thing, you know, so. Um, it's exhilarating. It really is. And it's calming at the same time too, because, you know, if you're not that far away from a, a big city, you just go out for an hour and you scream and go crazy or do whatever and then come back and you're calm and you're fine. And that's a lot healthier than sitting on Facebook and going, here's the two things I hate the most about Facebook. One is, um, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And I'm not gonna discuss this with you. I just want you to be dead. There is no discussing, you just need to die because you disagree. That's number one that I hate. And here, this is the worst one. I know I'm gonna lose some fans. I just don't like seeing pictures of somebody's cat sitting around. I just don't. I'm sorry, bro. I mean, you know, I know this one guy's like, my cat is watching Stephen Colbert again. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you know. It's become such a voyeuristic society and everybody's nosy about everybody and everybody wants, and everybody thinks that everybody wants to know what they're doing every second of the day which is, you know, not true. Like, I don't need to know what you're doing right now. You right. Know, I, like, I like to use Facebook and Instagram, for instance, uh, was, was great because, oh, you're going to be doing live or you got a show coming up. Oh, great. And that's how I try to use it as much marketing as to let people know where we're going to be. And then let's, let's get together and play some music or check right. out a show, you know? Right. For you, you're using it as a tool. And for a lot of people, it's become their COVID lifestyle. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so uh, that was one of the nicest things that when I was as doing the show for 26 weeks, um, people would send in. I would I would go back and I would almost not every time, but mostly and look at every comment that would come through, and they'd be sometimes, uh -huh. you know, six seven hundred comments. Wow, it's a lot of time. Yeah, and I would just look at it and like it, 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 because like I want people to know that I'm actually paying attention to what they're saying. Uh -huh. And it would be great because people would say, this is making me feel so happy. I had a terrible week. Like right. and just saying that, knowing that there was, we're using what we do, Rob, like talking, playing music to make the uplift people in a time where it's very depressing out there. Yeah. Means we're doing something which is great. They were making people feel good in a time when they, people are feeling not so good. Right. Well, I got to thank you so much for taking it an hour out of your day because I know you're busy with uh, oh, with your piano man. lessons uh, with Barry Harris now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that. It's, I mean, and I found this guy who's been giving, he's got like 70 something of these. It's called What I Learned from Barry Harris. I'm, I'm, I'm still only two minutes into episode four. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a guy out there, a young guy named Adam Neely. And if you ever get a chance to look him up, he is really funny. He's a young bass player, but he's like of the fearless young generation. Like one of the videos that I first saw of him is he said, okay, so I'm in Manhattan. I have three gigs. I'm subbing on bass on all three gigs. I have to play an upright gig. I have to play electric gig, uh, orchestral gig. And I'm just going to get really, really, really stoned and film the whole day and see what happens. Oh, that's hilarious. And it's just like, it's some of the funniest stuff that I've ever seen. So um, 
But yeah, you're, you're doing a show again uh, this coming Friday. Give us the date and information about that, or are you off Friday? This, this is a really special show coming up for me because oh, cool. it's Friday, October 2nd. It'll be, it, it, it was funny because the 25th show was the Silver Show, 25. Okay. Last week was 26. I call it Happy Year. Okay. So this one is uh, Friday, October 2nd, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And it's the day that my new radio single gets released to the public. Wow. And what's the name of the new single? It's called Style and Elegance. And Blake Aaron actually, actually mixed it. Oh, wow. That's so great, man. I saw Amari, that. Amari Williams on drums. Dwayne Smitty Smith on bass. Munyungo Jackson on percussion. Um, Westbird on piano. Elon Trotman on sax. Wow. Mixed by Blake, mix and master by Blake. And it, it comes this Friday out. Woo! So it's going to be a special show. We're going to be celebrating and partying. So get that, get, get something to drink with me, Rob, on the air Friday. We'll toast each other. Yeah, we got to do that, man. I got to, I got to see what I did with my, uh, with my necktie and my classy shirt. <laughs> because uh, I saw the picture of you on the cover of the new single. I was like, Oh, hell, I better step up my game right now. <laughs> Thanks, my brother. It was a great time. I know people are going to love this. And um, I, I, congratulations on your show. This is great. I love the feel of it. Uh, it's just fun to kick back. And it's fun just to tell stories and talk about stuff. You know, I do interviews sometimes that are so rudimentary about this and that. This is just fun, man. We just kick shooting the shirt <laughs> <laughs> all right my brother you have a good night and i'll let you know when it's going to be online thanks a lot rob you take care bro